Hi, today we're going to talk about solving the climate crisis. Make no mistake, we are in a climate emergency. The founder of 350.org, Bill McKibben, has set forth the math. And this was back before 2010. He said, we can burn 565 more gigatons of CO2 and stay below two degrees C increase in global warming. Anything more than that risks catastrophe for all of us on earth. The problem, the fossil fuel companies have 2,795 gigatons of carbon fossil fuel in their reserves, five times the safe amount, and their business model is to dig it up and burn it unless we stop them. These, this is what the nations of the world have been doing, emitting more and more and more and more carbon. If you look at the history of the earth, there have been warm periods, cooler periods, correlating with the emissions of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We are now at the some of the highest emissions of CO2 ever, and certainly the highest since humans have walked the earth. Nearly two thirds of the carbon emissions ever emitted have happened in the last four decades. 70% of these emissions can be attributed to 90 entities. These are the fossil fuel companies, the coal companies, the oil companies, the natural gas companies, a few large cement manufacturers, and the countries from Saudi Arabia to the US and China who have been emitting enormous amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Yes, every one of us is part of the problem. Every time you flip a light switch, if your electricity comes from a coal-fired power plant, Every time you drive your car, fly an airplane, you're part of the problem, but you're not the big part. However, all together, we are causing the planet to warm. When the economists say climate change is real, it's real. This was New York City, LaGuardia Airport, after Hurricane Sandy hit, flooding in the subways, and an enormous death toll from this one storm. And of course, hurricanes don't just happen in one place, they move around. And so it first hit the Caribbean and then it came up the coast, enormous losses. There were a few places where the lights stayed on. There is a co-op on Long Island where they had their own combined heat and power plant and of course, Goldman Sachs, which had a big generator in the basement. But here's what we're looking at if we don't get a grip on climate change. Sea levels are rising. As the Arctic sea ice melts, the sea itself is rising. And projections are that by 2030, much of the edges of Manhattan will be flooded. Tampa Bay, by 2030, the downtown is pretty much underwater. San Francisco, the financial district, Mission Bay, they'll be swimming. Indeed, five of the top 10 global cities are vulnerable to coastal flood flooding with a cost estimate of over a trillion dollars. Actually, it'll go much higher than that. Already, whole nations are at risk. The Maldives, Vanuatu, the Maldives mean height of land is something like eight feet. And so the government has started to tax tourists who come to the Maldives to build a fund so that the people who live there can have somewhere to move to. The impacts are much more than just flooding. In 2013 in Colorado, this was the beginning of summer, massive wildfires burning across the state. And this was the fall. 
in September, it rained. It doesn't rain much in Colorado in September. It's supposed to be part of the dry season. Record flooding. A fracking rig underwater. And of course, all of the pollution that attends to the oil and gas industry flowing downstream. There will be enormous cost to all of this. The Brookings Institution in 2014 said this will hit young people the hardest because the impacts will be felt worst as time goes by. And the, this kind of erratic weather will make it harder to grow food, driving up food costs perhaps as much as 84%. Indeed, in 2014, climate change cost the state of California billions of dollars as drought wiped out much of the agriculture to the point that the then Secretary of Energy, Dr. Stephen Chu, said by the end of the century, the nation's solid bowl could be a dust bowl. And I'm not quite sure how their cities will keep going. Hurricanes, Hurricane Harvey, hitting Houston, Hurricane Irma, hurricane after hurricane after hurricane, all on the satellites all at once. Mexico Beach, Florida, after Hurricane Michael in 2018, the picture above is before, the picture below is after. City's gone. The 2019 fires in California, 405 square miles. The California fires were set in part by the failure of the electric utility industries, particularly Pacific Gas and Electric, to do maintenance on their lines. And so when the wind blows, it blows power lines into trees or trees into power lines. The cost from the campfire, which killed 84 people put Pacific Gas and Electric into bankruptcy, said by the Wall Street Journal to be the first climate change bankruptcy, but probably not the last. At the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020, Australia caught fire. 46,000 square miles, 50% bigger than the fires in the Amazon because it was incredibly hot. Sydney, 120F in January of 2020. It killed people. It killed over a billion animals. Some species may now be extinct. It forced people literally onto the beaches to be rescued by the Australian Navy. Hurricane Ide in 2019 left thousands dead in Mozambique. First time a hurricane has hit that part of Africa. They don't even know how many people are dead. In the 80s, we averaged $1 billion storm per year. In the 90s, two such storms. In the aughts, five of them. 2011 set a new record, 14 weather-related disasters costing over a billion dollars. In 2020, the number was $24 billion storms. 210 billion in damages. The number of these billion dollar storms, the frequency is going up year by year by year. And again, costing taxpayers in cleaning up from the damages. And that figure is going to go up, perhaps as high as $35 billion per year if we don't do something about it. All in, global warming could cost the economy over a hundred billion each year by the end of the century. That's more than our gross domestic product. And of course the costs fall most heavily on poorer communities. The costs will fall all around the world. This is not an American problem. It is a global problem. And as concentrations of CO2 increase and the warming increases, this could cost up to 20% of global gross domestic product. 
every year compared to the cost of fixing it, which has been estimated somewhere between one and 5% of the cost. In 2019, the world came together in Copenhagen to try to seal the deal, to try to put in place a global agreement of how we were going to deal with climate change. And we failed. This poster was in the Copenhagen airport of the then sitting president saying, I'm sorry, we could have fixed this problem and we didn't. So what moves a politician? Turns out it's you and me. In 2014, in September, more than 400,000 of us filled the streets of New York City, marching for climate solutions. And the next day, Mr. Obama went to the United Nations and pledged that he would take action. He said, the alarm bells keep ringing, our citizens keep marching. He noticed. He said, we have to work together before it's too late. It's happening, it's happening faster than our efforts to solve it. We are the first generation to feel the effects of climate change and the last who can do anything about it. This is on us. So Obama met with the premier of China, and they forged a historic deal where China, the other large emitter in the world, largest emitter, and the US both committed to begin reducing our emissions of carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases. There are six greenhouse gases altogether, although CO2 is by far the most plentiful it's not the worst. Things like methane are much worse. The fluorinated hydrocarbons are 6,000 times as bad for global warming as CO2, but they're relatively smaller amounts of them. Here's what China has started to pledge to do. They create the world's largest carbon market peak its carbon emissions, perhaps as early as 2030, and install massive amounts of renewable energy. Then in 2015, the world came together in Paris at another of these conference of parties of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is the agreement of the world's nations to try to do something about climate change. In 2009, Connie Hedegaard tried to do this at Copenhagen and failed. In 2015, Christiana Figueres chaired the Conference of Parties. It was a tough negotiation. Many of us negotiated through the nights and up to the very last moment. And in the end, Christiana pulled it out. She sealed the deal. An historic agreement of the world's nations to get serious about limiting carbon emissions. This is Mr. Obama's signature on the deal. The deal called for keeping global warming below two degrees C increase over the pre-industrial levels and really trying hard to keep it at no more than 1.5 degree C increase in global warming. However, what that agreement committed nations to do is nowhere near enough. Paris, the Paris Agreement was a, an historic achievement and it got us to the starting line. The scientists like uh, Dr. Jim Hansen say that we have to limit global warming to no more than a degree above pre-industrial levels. The Paris pledges would have us at three degrees above. Business as usual, four or more. Paris, the Paris Agreement 
impacted industries. The fossil fuel industries began to realize that their world is coming to an end. This was a real blow to the people who said, I don't believe in global warming. They spent $500 million promoting climate denial over the past 20 years. Money, I argue, was wasted. Well, perhaps not. They also elected Mr. Trump as president of the United States, who in June of 2017 said, we're quitting the Paris Accord, putting us in a somewhat sketchy company. Why? Because he was bought and paid for. The states in the United States that are most economically dependent on extracting oil and gas, voted for him. He beat Clinton in all 12 of the states that topped the list of fossil fuel emitters. But other states said, wait a minute, our economies are harmed by global warming. They said, we're still in, we commit to abide by the Paris Agreement. More than 1,200 companies, states, cities, universities, entities representing 120 million Americans and 35% of carbon emissions said, we're still in. Economic experts overwhelmingly said, abiding by the Paris Accord is good economics that our economy is already benefiting from what the other countries who remained in the Paris Accord are doing and that we will benefit more and more into the future. Big companies took out a full page ad in newspapers like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal saying that we have to continue to be a partner of the nations of the world in solving the climate crisis. Companies including Google and Intel, Unilever, Schneider Electric, 116 companies have set science-based targets for reducing their carbon emissions. These are targets that will hold them to the levels that scientists say we have to get to if we're going to solve the climate crisis. Mayors, more than a thousand mayors have committed to a climate protection agreement. Cities, cities are pledging to go 100% renewably powered. Why? Because it's better for their economics. So the politics are somewhat crazy because as renewable energy wins in the marketplace, as the climate solutions are just better business, Five of the states that get the largest percentage of their power from wind voted for Trump. So did Texas, which increasingly is the leading wind power and solar power state in the nation. Republican mayors started to say, wait a minute, this, this position is hurting us. The mayor of Miami, a Republican, after one of the hurricanes, said, we have to talk about climate change. This is hurting us. And so in the years of the Trump administration, interestingly, in the first three years, more coal plants were closed than in the eight years of the Obama administration. The Guardian came out with this article. The UN has projected, had originally projected 12 years to save the planet from climate change. The Guardian said, make that 18 months in July of 2019, because they said the election in 2020 is what will determine whether or not we can save life as we know it on the planet. And on the 20th of January, 2021, President Biden re-entered 
the Paris Accord and appointed a very strong climate team. Governor Jennifer Granholm, who had been the governor of Michigan, great advocate for renewable energy. Michael Reagan, who had run environmental protection in North Carolina. Deb Haaland, first Native American woman appointed as Secretary of the Interior. What they will find, as we wrote in this book, The Way Out, Kickstarting Capitalism to Save Our Economic Ass, is that climate protection is just better business. Yes, the science is uncertain. The scientists argue over how fast it's happening, how bad it will be. Here's the science I like. But let's assume the scientists are wrong. Let's assume the climate deniers are correct. Now, don't go to Vegas on the odds of that being true. But if all you are is a profit maximizing capitalist, you'll do exactly what you would do if you were scared to death of climate change, because we know how to solve this crisis at a profit. If it's a hoax, we'll make a lot of money. If it's a real problem, we'll make a lot of money. Either way, let's go. The science in that sense is bar talk. And this is the position taken by these gentlemen, Mayor Michael Bloomberg, Tom Steyer, Hank Paulson, businessmen, all of them, who wrote a report called Risky Business, saying that the damages are already mounting up and they're costing American business. The companies that report to the Carbon Disclosure Project had twice the average total return of the global 500 from 2005 to 2011. I was with CDP on the floor of the stock exchange in New York City when they announced their 2014 findings. This is Tom Rivet Karnak, who then ran North American CDP, that the companies that bake sustainability into their core strategies outperform. The companies that are leading in measuring and managing their carbon footprint have 18% higher return on investment than the laggards, 67% higher than the companies that deny that climate change is real and say, we're not, we're not going to pay any attention. They're making more money. The innovators outperform. Positive correlation between financial performance of companies and their ability to successfully implement disruptive market innovations to solve the climate crisis. Conversely, the companies that emit carbon are valued lower. I worked with a company called Diversi that said for every dollar we invest in climate protection, we get $2 back achieving savings so far of more than $31 million. You can do a lot of this for free, just through behavior change, through turning off lights, turning off unused computers. We worked with a company that had 6,300 computers, monitors that they left on 24 seven because of some urban myths. Oh, it shortens the life of the computer to turn it off and on. No. IT needs it left on. No, one night a week would do fine. Just posting a policy saying, turn the darn thing off if you're not sitting in front of it would save that company $700,000 a year. And this is a problem across the American economy. We waste $2.8 billion a year leaving computers on. Ford Motor Company figured this out. Shut off computers, save a million dollars a year. You can do this at home. Turning off your computer will save you about enough to go out for supper. Ohio State University published this policy, turn your computers off, 
save themselves a quarter million dollars, which they can put to their academic programs. I worked with this little company, Mirancho Tortillas. They make um, tortillas, which they wanted to sell to Walmart. Walmart published the Walmart Sustainability Scorecard. Question number one, do you report to the carbon, do you measure your carbon footprint? Question number two, do you report to the Carbon Disclosure Project, CDP? Mirancho said, what do we do? So we help them eliminate waste, get more efficient light bulbs, get more efficient ovens to bake their tortillas. The cost to the company, $14,000. The savings the first year, $32,000. Add in all of the waste savings, almost half a million dollars per year. Germany found this out pretty early on. Their GDP up 28%, the greenhouse gas emissions down 22%. A brilliant group out of the UK called Carbon Tracker came out with a report about five years ago that said, we have to leave most of the carbon in the ground if we are going to solve the climate crisis. What you do with your money, says Christiana Figueres, will determine whether or not we solve the climate crisis and what kind of a future we're going to leave to our children. And we are witnessing now a tectonic shift in how the financial industry looks at climate change. This, <coughs> this was to some extent kicked off by comments from this man, Beavis Longstreth. He was a commissioner on the Securities and Exchange Commission who said it, it's entirely plausible, even predictable, that continuing to hold equities in fossil fuel companies will be ruled negligence. So by 2018, $6 trillion had divested from ownership in fossil companies. That number is now about 13 trillion. Why? Because the fossil companies are not performing. This is Exxon compared to the Standard & Poor's, the S&P. The paler blue line is the S&P. The dark blue line is Exxon. For years, Exxon ruled the market until around 2017 when it stopped doing that. And indeed, if you held Exxon stock, the value of your stock was worth no more in late 2019 than it would have been in 2007. Fluctuated up and down, but it hadn't grown. Goldman Sachs sell Exxon stock. And over the last year or so, Almost $200 billion has been wiped off Exxon's balance sheet, off its market valuation. Tesla is now has a higher market valuation than Exxon. And Exxon was asked to exit the Dow Jones, sustain, Dow Jones index because of this loss in value. Now, this is a tectonic shift. In the late 80s, seven of the top 10 companies in the S&P were oil and gas. Then it was only Exxon, and then Exxon began to lag. To the point that a man named Tom Sanzillo calculated that had the New York Common Fund, the big pension fund in New York, divested from holdings in Exxon 10 years ago, they would have made $17.5 billion more than they did make. This is why in 2017, a group of us built a new company called Change Finance to create the first truly fossil fuel free exchange traded fund. And we rang the bell on Wall Street Change Finance is leading now a whole group of funds 
that are claiming to be fossil fuel free. If you want to invest in this sort of thing, though, be careful. Some of them say they're fossil fuel free, but they hold Exxon or hold oil field service companies. 2019, Greta Thunberg led the climate march down Broadway in New York City. And a few months later, Goldman Sachs CEO said there is an urgent need to act, but also a powerful business and investing case to do that. Goldman is starting to divest. The Bank of International Settlements started to talk about green swan events, surprises in the financial market, potentially extremely financially disruptive events that could be behind the next systemic financial crisis. Well, they didn't see the pandemic coming. The pandemic will abate. Climate change is getting worse. So in early January of 2020, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, the largest wealth management company in the world, stated that climate change has become a defining factor in companies' long-term prospects when millions of people took to the streets. You ever think that what you do doesn't matter? Remember these statements. Marching, protesting, writing letters, speaking to your Congress people, it all matters. Fink's letter for the first time started laying out BlackRock's commitment to sustainability. Now it has a long way to go. Uh, don't for a moment think that BlackRock is a sustainable company, but these are all signs of the shift of these massive companies away from business as usual. BlackRock said they would begin to exit certain investments that present a high sustainability related risk, such as coal. I would argue all of the fossils are a high sustainability related risk. And they will get there. They will get there again for market fundamentals. Investing in fossil fuel is just not good business. Microsoft in early 2020 said, we are going not just carbon neutral, not just offsetting whatever emissions we make, carbon negative. We are going to offset all of the emissions that our company has ever caused by investing in regenerative agriculture and nature-based solutions. We're gonna put a billion dollars to these solutions. Bezos at Amazon then turned around and said, well, I'm gonna put 10 billion in. Now he has no earthly idea how to do this, but again, these are all signs that these large market players are getting serious about climate protection. If you take the Paris projections, per unit of GDP, our carbon emissions are going steadily downward. And this is good, but we need to go a great deal further because as our GDP continues to grow, our carbon emissions continue to grow. And so if we don't get serious now, it will become very, very difficult to save the climate. I like the Sidney Harris cartoon, the two old boys scribbling equations on the blackboard. And in the middle, it says then a miracle occurs. And the one old boy says to the other, I think you should be a little more explicit here in step two. Yeah, we need to be a lot more explicit about how we solve the climate crisis. We need entrepreneurs. In nature, carbon is not the world's greatest poison. It's the building block of life. So, How do we answer questions like this? How are we going to fly our airplanes around? I'm very fond of this little company, Lanza Tech, entrepreneurial company. 
that captures carbon emissions as they come out of, say, a steel refinery or an oil refinery, they feed it to microbes. The microbes turn it into ethanol or jet fuel. So these are examples of a steel refinery in China, an oil refinery in India, a solid waste, municipal solid waste disposal center in Japan, all using Lanzatech technologies, taking these gases, feeding them to the microbes and turning them in to fuel for cars, fuel for airplanes, or things that we durably use like tires or fabrics. This is the circular economy of carbon. Young Greta Thunberg, no one is too small to make a difference. She said adults keep saying, we owe it to the young people to give them hope. I don't want your hope. I want you to feel the fear that I feel and then I want you to act. I want you to act as if the house were on fire, because it is. This is the future faced by young people. So my friends, Tom Karnak, Christiana Figueres, wrote this book, The Future We Choose, Surviving the Climate Crisis, laying out a number of the solutions, as I will do in the next two modules. Bill Clinton said, it's the economy, stupid. There really are only two solutions that solve the climate crisis, renewable energy and regenerative agriculture. So these will be the next two modules that we'll talk about. And I hope to lay out for you the evidence that we can solve the climate crisis and we can do so at a profit. Stay with me, it's gonna get fun. <laughs>